Hey, before we start the episode, this is just a reminder, this episode does take place before we had changed to a strictly interview format, and as such, there may be references to the other episodes we used to do that don't have anything to do with that. You can disregard that, and just enjoy the episode. The Graphic Histories Podcast. Hey, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, and I will be your host once again. Thank you to Ookla the Mock for our theme song, Superpowers. And thank you, gentle listener, for tuning in once again to my show. And happy Halloween. Coincidentally, this episode falls on the Saturday, which this year falls on Halloween, which is one of my favorite times of year. I'm very excited to uh, for tomorrow, in which you'll have, I'm recording this on the night before, which is... Playing it a little fast and loose, which isn't what I normally do. However, this week was busy. It was the only time I could find. So don't judge me. Just listen, you jerk. <laughs> However, uh, I am excited for Halloween. I am planning on just hanging out, having a few drinks with my wife and some friends, and watching horror movies. That's all I want to do all day. Um, looking at probably The Thing, which I haven't watched in a while, and it's a personal favorite. I love John Carpenter. Um, thinking about American Werewolf from Paris. Uh, which I actually, oh, actually London. I always say American Werewolf in Paris first, which is funny because that was like the the pseudo sequel with Tom Everett that uh, doesn't. I don't think it has any real connection to the original. However, I have seen ads for that one all the time, and there's posters at the store when it came out, and all these things that, as a kid, it got ingrained in my head before I really knew that there was a previous film, which is a, a called classic, called American Werewolf in London. So I'm thinking of watching that, as well as a few others. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but those are the, the two that I'm really honing in on at the moment. I do have a friend coming over who uh, I think has seen American Werewolf in Paris, so or in London. <laughs> Look, I did it again. American Werewolf in London, so we may squ- scrap that and swap it for something else, and I'll just watch it on my own time later. Um, however, I'm very excited. I hope you have a wonderful Halloween. It is a great time of year. It's a lot of fun. It's I love horror movies. I love spooky stuff, so it's it's a nice time to celebrate that with friends and family. And I hope you get to go out have some as, as safely as you can in the current condition um, and have some fun, for sure. Uh, I am definitely going to be doing that at home. So uh, you can have fun wherever you go. You know, like uh, the Buck Ride Bonsai says, uh, wherever you go, there you are. Uh, today I, is one of our featured interview episodes, and we will be talking to Troy Little, a good friend of mine who I met on the con circuit many years ago and became fast friends with, mainly because we have a lot in common when it comes to movies and comics and and books and uh, and he references quite a few of his books on the show on on the episode um, th- most of them all of them pretty much can be found online I know uh, Kurosawa can be found on Amazon um, and copies of Angora napkin can be found on the Pe- Pegamoose press website as well and as well as uh, his other books we mentioned by his wife Brenda little uh, the calls of the turnip King and some of her my little pony stuff. Is available on there as well. So, uh, after talking to him, I discovered I didn't own the Angora Napkin Volume One. I only had two and three, so I quickly ordered uh, the combo set, which is one and two, as well as a DVD of the pilot episode, which we do reference in the in the uh, in the episode. For that, it was a pilot for a cartoon that never got never got beyond the pilot stage. That comes with it as well. So I'm very excited to to have that arrive and get my completest Troy Little collection. So uh, I sent him a gift saying I just ordered it, and uh, I said, soon I'll have all of Troy Little, including Troy Little himself, and sent a little gif of Annie Wilkes from Misery saying, uh, you know, you'll be safe, I'm your biggest fan. So uh, <laughs> hopefully he got the joke and wasn't as creeped out uh, as someone could be by getting that gif sent to you. Um, yes, yeah, so we will roll right into our special Halloween edition, although it's not very special or Halloweeny, but it is special because Troy Little is here. And we'll be talking to him. So here's my conversation with indie comic superstar Troy Little. Uh, 
There you are. There I am, backlit you as usual. No, that's all right. I'm not. Yeah, I am too. Actually, I need to get a light like in front of me in this in this room. I'm just surrounded by. Well, gremlins, gre- gremlin, <laughs> gremlin replicas. I have those two. There's also the uh, the one, the stripper one, down in the corner here. To see him. Yeah. Yeah. He's got the glasses okay. and everything. And uh, yeah, how are you, man? How are things? Good. Good. Not too bad. You know, as far as things go, right? It's. Yeah, you find 2020 it. 2020 uh, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, synonymous with bad news at this point. Uh, yeah. when, when, like, the celebrity deaths kind of began and people were like, ah, oh, it's 2020, they've claimed another one, you know, like before the COVID thing. I was like, well, you know, like, you got to do the math. We're all hitting the age where the people that really influenced us when we were kids are now, like, you know, in their 70s and 80s and, and they're going to start dropping <laughs> off. But, you know. And I was like, so it sucks, but it's kind of the way life goes. And then you're like, boom, coronavirus and and all these people that shouldn't be dying are dying. So it's, uh, it's way worse. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Yeah, way <laughs> worse. So I'll never tempt fate again. No, no, don't. It's just not worth it. No, absolutely not. But uh, do you find the climate with, with the coronavirus has affected you work-wise very much? Um, early on, more or less, when... Uh, when the kids were not in school and summer vacation, like trying to get any work done was the absolute biggest problem we had. The rest of it has been, I mean, PEIs, COVID free, you know, it's like we've, we're like the go-to place in Canada. <laughs> Everyone's true. looking to move in here now. It's just from everywhere else. As the, you just have the guy standing at the border with the shotguns, keeping, keeping the infected out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. What what province are you from? Ontario. That's right. Keep walking. Keep on walking. Out to sea, boy. That's right. That's right. They just put them on a barge and send them out to the ocean. Yeah. No, it's been fine, honestly. It's just like, like it, just trying to get the work done is is everything else is a distraction. You know, US yeah. is a distraction, pandemic's a distraction. That's true. plenty of distractions to go on right now. That is true, but you're managing to power through, and you guys are. I know, just following from Pegamoose. Are we? Are we started? By the way, or are we just? Tired? Oh yeah, we've been going for for two hours now. Okay. <laughs> no, no, <Whoa>. we. Have, we <laughs> Where am I? We are going. One time, I can't remember who it was. But I was interviewing someone, and we were like an hour in, and they're like, "Did we start yet?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah we're good. We've been going get... since I, basically since we started. I figured I'd just edit. I'd cut cut it in when it made sense." <laughs> the conversation started rolling, right? But. Tip, pro tip is tell you, tell your guests when it starts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. I actually stole it from Mark Marin because he never does that either. Like I listen to his podcasts and like, oh yeah, ten fifteen minutes in, so it'll be like, are we are we starting? And he's like, yeah, we've been going for like you know, and then, yeah, it's like a Norm McDonald type <laughs> thing too. Yeah, right? I think he tries to like you know just get into an actual conversation without sort of making it feel like you have to be on now. Oh, okay. which I kind of respect, but I also understand it's not the same process for everybody yeah um all good then yeah we're in we're rolling we're already you're you're in it now man you can't escape i'm in deep now you're in deep (laughs) you're locked in uh how's your halloween plans going are you watching tons of scary movies uh we watched the new adams family cartoon Mm -hmm. last night uh i had low expectations and it it didn't even meet those oh really so. man that sucks because i wanted to watch it and I, I i saw the cast like the voice cast and i was impressed like uh, i always thought oscar isaac would be an awesome like live action gomez adams so sure. uh, the fact yeah. he was there i was like well that's cool and you know um it was a shirley theron and smorticia like it's all kinds of cool well yeah. voice actors were were fine it's yeah. just the movie the story the you know stylistic choices was just so straight to video it was you know, it looked like something from the nineties, you know, like, it wasn't very good. And I mean, I say straight from the nineties. So were the original movies that, well, like the original movies, but you know, the, yep. The Barry the Adams family view, values and all that. Yeah. They're great. And I, I watched those recently with the kids and they love them. And like, it's so refreshing just to watch them again. Cause they hold up so well. There's like um, an edge of darkness to like, I want to say like all early 90s movies, but certainly like early 90s family movies. There's like a tinge of like, even some of the animated stuff like in the late 80s and early 90s, like a tinge of of uh, almost like more dark than what you could probably get away with in a kid's movie nowadays. Yeah. Like, you know, like the Adams Family had some pretty like, I mean, it was all kind of fun and done in tongue in cheek, but there's some pretty dark imagery in that movie. 
Get yeah, I like, think that's what the the new one kind of lost is it really tried to contrast it with like this big bright pastel world around them and it a little bit overshadowed the gothic kind of Adams family vibe. Oh, that's, so. that sucks. I mean, I, like I was talking to someone the other day about Casper. Like I watched that movie, that live action Casper movie when I was a kid. I probably watched it like 10 times, 20 times maybe. And like, you know, you have people dying, becoming ghosts, like her dad dies. It's a big turning point where, you know, Casper has to sacrifice him getting to live again to bring her dad back to her. Like that's some pretty heavy themes for like a yeah. kid's movie, you know? Even even Hocus Pocus, like with the the guy that was turned to a cat for an eternity, like that's you know, and and, mm. and his death at the end, like it's all fairly dark stuff. It's stuff that I don't know if you get away with nowadays. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, are you guys doing anything for Halloween? Like, are, are you guys are you guys allowed to trick? Yeah, we get we're allowed to trick or treat. So oh, we're trick or treating. Yeah. No, you just usually hit the neighborhood. Um, Nathan's uh, geared up for Pikachu. Nice. And the twins are various anime characters <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, when i was talking to brenda she was telling me about that they're leaning hard into the anime world aren't they oh uh, yeah they well they had for a while i don't know i mean still a pretty big influence for them um but they're not as into it like they're not sitting there just obsessing over country roll and stuff anymore no um for a while it was all my hero academia and you know and a whole ton of anime stuff they just obsessed with and manga and it- uh now I don't know what they're kind of just they got cell phones and now they're just on that. Now they're like teenagers <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, they're totally teenagers right now. Awesome. What how old are they now? 14. Oh yeah, that's that's teen that's that's rich into fun teenager age. Do, do you feel yeah. like do you feel like a complete moron now or just sometimes? No, no, I can uh, I understand the TikToks and <laughs> I meant in the, on, I meant in the I'm way that like teen, teenagers just sort of always look at their parents <laughs> if they hit a certain age like you're the dumbest person in the world. And I think that's part uh, of the reason why I've never had much of an interest in being a father because I watch like people that have teenage kids and the way the kids talk to them, even the way I talk to my parents. Like if that happened to me, I don't know if I could handle it. I think I just like either start see, drinking or the just thing you, you got nerd cred that that we've got too so mm. we get the kids in a lot of ways the stuff that they're into we we kind of at least get it in some periphery level i suppose that's true yeah because like my yeah. dad was like a carpenter woodsman hunter guy not not, not never looked at a comic book in his yeah life. like so, i told the kids uh you know hey check this out and i'm showing the new mandalorian trailer for saturday and they're like we're watching it right away dad i'm like you bet we are <laughs> oh man See, now i want kids now i want 14 year old kids that are into the man i am su- i think it's friday actually it's the 30th right that it comes yeah out? yeah i'm yeah. super pumped beyond pumped yep is yeah your- i watched it with them and they loved it so it was great is that your star wars your star wars now like the uh i know no. i know i saw on fa- social media you weren't a big fan of uh, rise of skywalker so. nobody was <laughs> <laughs> I, I was surprised because you were a vo- you were a vocal fan of the Last Jedi. We're not I love fan, the Last, I last yeah, I Jedi. Was good. It was a yeah. good movie. I, I can I can say all kinds of great things about that movie and where it was taking Star Wars. And I'm like, oh, good, thanks. You know, this is kind of refreshing. Mm. And then um, they just undid it all in the following. And they movie. just undermined everything and it made it look like there was no plan. And J.J. Abram, Abrams is like completely failed. You failed me for the last time, J.J. Abrams, you know, <laughs> after your lost ending. And <laughs> yeah, that was a rough one, too. Um, so I'm just like, you know, if you can't stop and plan out a movie or a series, at least have an idea how it's going to end. Don't don't do it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, I thought. Uh, the force awakens i loved it like i thought it, it was, was good like i like was the right amount of, like people said it did too much but like that to- toxic star wars fandom thing i've always tried to keep at a, a very far distance from myself because like there when that movie came out it, the the people that would the 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 owners of star wars as i call them the people online that feel as though they own star wars and should do what mm-hmm. they want are like you know it's too it's too much like the old one you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, they make their Last Jedi, which is, like, completely different. They're like, no, it's too different. I don't like this one either. It's like, you have to find the perfect lukewarm amount in the center of what I want, nostalgia and new. And you got to hit that baseline. You have to read my individual mind. And unless you do it, it's garbage and I hate it. Basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, the Force Awakens was great. Like, I think it was a good uh, nod to the old school, a little bit of an intro to the new. Like Brenda would never grew up with Star Wars and mm-hmm. was not a Star Wars fan. And she saw that movie and really liked it. 
Mm. She's like, I like the characters. I like this. It's kind of like my intro to Star Wars. Yeah, it was and accessible. Think, yeah, she's like me, you know, without being as vocal about it, is disappointed in how the last movie wrapped up as well. Yeah, I feel started like... so good and then trailed off. I, like this is this is sort of my my complaint when it comes to this sort of stuff because I feel as though it fell into the same thing that I feel like Alien Covenant fell into, which and I know you're a big Alien fan. How do you feel yeah, about not, Alien Covenant before I get into yeah, that? Yeah, Alien Covenant is a good comparison to Rise of Skywalker. It's like wow, you were trying to take something interesting and yeah. move it in a new direction, then basically you listened to the online community and said, "Here's your damn Alien." Yeah, you know. And undid everything and just ruined and, it. And like, just made a flat, boring movie. Exactly. I would have loved yeah. to see what he had in mind for continuing that story without them wrapping it up in a flashback and killing the main character in like a flashback. Like it's yeah. such a... Uh, but as far as Rise Skywalker goes, I, that, that's exactly how I felt. Like, you know, they just listened to the fans. They saw the fans were angry because they did something different. So they undid all the cool stuff that, you know, um, The Last Jedi did. I walked out of a movie depressed, a Star Wars movie, and I was depressed for days. I felt so down, like, just yeah. sad. Like, that's how you want to end it? I know. That's, that's the end of the trilogy. Like, I know, it's such as a trilogy as it was, ham-fisted. But, you know, come on. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And, like, a part of me is like, well, maybe, maybe we'll get to see the characters again. Maybe they'll they'll show up in other movies. Maybe this isn't the end, but I, I don't know. Like, I... I know John Boyega is fairly vocal against Star Wars right now. <laughs> so I don't think he's coming back anytime soon. Uh, and I really liked him. I thought there was so much he like great. considering so good. what they turn him into. I mean, the first movie is so featured. The second one, you know, um, I actually really like, like, I know you and I are in the same camp of liking the last Jedi and uh, mm-hmm. I, I have continued arguments with my friend about it because he did not, but even the side story with him, I liked all that. I thought it was very interesting. Um, the third one, though, he's barely in it. Like, and if he is, it's not that important. It's just regular yeah. game, like a side character that didn't see. Um, and they did Rose Tico dirty, man. That was. That's oh yeah, one. yeah. It's that just, was. Yeah. That was nasty. That was. Yeah, <sighs> it's like I'm gonna stay behind and do important stuff, and they're like, "Well, we're gonna make it seem like we're not just getting her out of the way by saying she's doing important stuff." But in yeah. essence, they just got her out of the way. Yeah, it's taken bottom spot uh, in my Star Wars pantheon. Really, you even know, over the uh, the ho- the holiday special, did it make it? Well, I've watched the holiday special more times than I've seen Rise of Skywalker so far. So that is true. I, I think I've only uh, watched the theater. Um, so yeah, I'd say it probably. But as far as the main, I guess, tr- you know, series or whatever, like the Attack of the Clones was, was the weakest for me, up until the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, more so than Phantom Menace. You thought? I like the Phantom Menace just fine. I like it okay. I mean, for the most part, I just feel like there's a lot of. I was I just started watching that show on Netflix, The Toys That Made Us. Have you seen? Yeah. That? Yeah, 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 I watched the video game one they just did a while ago, and I was like, I'm gonna watch the toy one. And the first episode is all about Star Wars toys. It's so and, good. And they're talking, yeah, it was. And they're ta- <laughs> when they're talking to the guy who was like saying how the first movie seemed really long and like, and how, and they just show some clips of like people talking about like trade embargoes and like economics and finance. Mm-hmm. And, and they're just saying, like, I can't understand why kids wouldn't enjoy this, you know, but, but kids did like those, those movies and those toys and did very well mm-hmm. like, amongst that generation's children. So, I mean, yeah. And, to me, it's I, I I liked some of the world building. I liked where they went. I I really love in the Mandalorian how they're um they're marrying it all in like a fun little That's way. Like, just blowing my mind. I know it, it. They get it. They get they it do. so they hardcore. Do. And I was like, when I was I saw a, a picture and I was like, oh my god, a picture. It's, no, it's the ice cream bucket. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the Wilro Hood. Like, I saw it and I recognized it. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, Even, like, his weapon, that prong thing, which is, like, right from the first in the Boba Fed in the holiday yeah. special. Yeah. The, uh, even seeing a pit droid again. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, in, in an old engine in the background of that episode where they go back to Tatooine of a pod racer. Like, just stuff like that is just such very cool they, they do it so well because they don't like nudge and wink you with it it's yeah. just there and yeah, it's if part you of the get world it, it's part of the world and that's just the right way to treat it and it's just such a, a great marriage of like what star wars was initially which is sort of like a samurai movie space western you know yeah. uh, almost every single storyline from every episode you could almost pinpoint from an old western movie or tv show like 
have gun will travel or one of those ones like the one where they're teaching the village how to fight was like straight out of like i can't remember yeah. which which so samurai yeah, yeah exactly and uh and which, which a lot got lifted by a lot of western movies as well so yeah it was just such a such a cool throwback and, and love letter to the fans and i'm super amped to see uh to see where they're gonna go with this season yeah i hope they don't uh they don't suffer from like what comics do where they like just start jamming special appearances by spider-man in every issue you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that that's uh that, that's usually like reserved for when when the new yeah when the new comic comes out so like the first five issues every issue is basically a cameo from the one new what it's, it's always spider-man it's, it's always spider-man Spider power pack featuring spider-man <laughs> yeah dark hawk is like spider-man then then venom then like nova like every episode issue was like a ghost rider whoever the big character was at the time so yeah those early comics are hilarious because they they totally fall into that yeah so i hope they don't kind of start overstuffing it and you get like a spider-man 3 you know yeah yeah which you know talking about movies that most people <laughs> hate that, yeah. that, you, that you can find redeeming qualities in i actually like spider-man 3 i'm sorry i know the I dance know. part was amazing was, <laughs> his emo moment was just like the greatest and how they referenced that too in spider-verse was like priceless yeah i'm pretty excited about that. well especially with everything like all these announcements about what spider-man 3 is going to be the the marvel one and like that apparently told mcguire and andrew garfield have been uh you know are coming back to play the roles again and jamie fox is back as electro i my theory is that he's going to be the regular universe electro like now and mm -hmm. that'll tie somewhat into what they're doing because I don't know, just like, I, apparently they're going to cameo in Doctor Strange, so like they're opening up the multiverse kind of idea, which is really cool. Um, -dub -dub -dub. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't had enough multiverse going on. That's true, yes, you're deep into the Rick and Morty stuff as well, right? I finally watched the, the new series too, the new season, I guess I should say. Uh -huh. So, and yeah, it's still think? good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's still pretty good. Yeah, uh, do you feel it measured up to the other seasons as far as like every episode really? I always found Rick and Morty a hit or miss. When it hits, it's really good. Now, when it misses, it's it's kind of can be a bit mediocre. But yeah, I even feel like the worst episodes are better than most of the things you see on TV for sure. But yeah, like yeah, there's there's a lot put into an episode. But when man, when they're good, they are so good. Like, like that's what kind of gets me is just how much is put into that show. Oh man, and the ideas and the concepts are just throwaway gags. You know, like yeah. it's just something that's like a a, a one off gag laugh, like Roy the video game or something else yeah. like that. That's just such a a, a deep intricate concept. <laughs> That's just like this is it that yeah laugh goodbye you know and it's and that's uh, why we get to do all these comics like you know the further adventures of Sleepy Gary exactly <laughs> I mean we we all want to know what that you know hypothetical character's uh, backstory is aside yeah. from the homosexual relationship with Jerry <laughs> <laughs> and Hammerai like come on there's so many like that, that, whole, episode, that one that episode. episode alone is like was a Penn Sylvester and Ghost oh, in the my. Jar and. <laughs> uh just ridiculous uh, oh there's a what's this a uh photography been, yeah <laughs> I, I've had, I had to do I was in Maine at a comic con and I have I have this Rick and Morty poster with a little blank space in the corner I do sketches for people I think you were so, right here actually yeah I do uh you roll the dice you pay the price yes, right yes and I got and 18 on mine you got 18 it's <laughs> yeah. good you paid a uh, paid almost the full price for that yeah, sucker my, my bird uh, you got oh you got bird man so I had, I was in Maine and somebody asked me, I like, what character do you want? And I was still pretty new to Rick and Morty back then. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Photo Raptor. And I was like, Photo Raptor? I'm trying to think. <laughs> Photo Raptor. Anyway, I had to look up my phone and I saw, okay, I vaguely remember the four seconds he was on the screen. <laughs> so I draw that in there. And then a couple hours later, you know, another guy comes up and I'm like, what character do you want? And he's like, Photo Raptor. I've never had anyone ask me for Photo Raptor again, but for some reason, people in Maine like, really dig on Photo You really Raptor. dig on Photo Raptor? Uh, that's interesting because you have kind of a history of doing so many comics that are kind of licensed properties, like uh, um, Powerpuff Girls for, for quite a while, uh, Rick and yeah. Morty now. Um, and I feel like there's another one I'm missing somewhere in there too. Uh, licensed Tur ones. What? Turtles? You did some uh, no. no, but that was the stuff you did with Laird. But do you feel like there's this weird, like when fans of these series come up to your conventions, they expect you to know everything about the series? Well, yeah, not only that, like they're, they assume, I guess, you're as excited about it as they are mm. and, and not only watched the episodes once or twice, but like live and breathe the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. 
Um, some people think you created the character. So you get asked, why do you make their eyes look like they got little star squiggle shapes? And I'm like, I don't, didn't do that. That's, you know, <laughs> or like, I love the Powerpuff Girls. I can't believe I'm meeting the person who created them. And I'm like, I didn't create them. I just drew this book here. So and you, sometimes you just can tell that they didn't clue in. I mean, they're yeah. looking at you like they met, you know, that's, that's a... somebody important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you're still important. You don't, don't downsize yourself. You're certainly, I, I've, that's very interesting. I never thought about that, but I guess that's true. Some people probably would not make that connect. I, I would hope mostly children, but I imagine there may be a few adults too that would, would want yeah, to. Yeah, no, it runs a gamut for sure. Some yeah. kids like definitely think so, but I've definitely had seen some parents would be like, oh, my kids love the Powerpuff Girls. And will you sign this to them? You know, and I'm no, kind of can tell they think I created it. So. Yeah, but why? But why? Why ruin the fantasy? Why shatter the illusion? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Until they get old enough to look it up, or they try to sell it on eBay, and they're like, "That's what? right." Get crushed later on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel it, it just sets them up for the crashing disappointments of adulthood. I mean, they're already it does exactly. You get you get that early enough on, just on the cusp of teenagehood. You know <laughs> that the rest of it is going to be disappointment after disappointment until you're dead. <laughs> Just one after another, line them, I'm knocking them down like dominoes. Right. This is just the beginning, kids. I'm the first of many. Yeah, this is the first of many disappointments to come. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that should be on your on your like your banner in front of your table or something. First of many disappointments. <laughs> I have to request being like near the door. <laughs> I'll never get you're asked just back like to super conventions. sad, like your yeah. shirt's all shabby, and you're like, you know, you're just sitting there looking depressed, all scraggly. I'll never get asked back to conventions. <laughs> I feel like you may be onto something creating the. Uh, uh, Chip Zarsky will steal it before I do it. So, uh, <laughs> so where did uh, I guess we could, we could travel back in time to uh, to young Troy? So where did young where did where did the genesis of Troy begin? uh summerside uh summerside yeah yeah. (laughs) like i have how bad you want to go here well let's inset no i'm just kidding i was gonna say conception but uh (laughs) uh uh, like uh when did art become a thing was that always a thing or did they discover that later on as a child or yeah i think it was just the thing i always did mostly because my dad was a, a creative person he would he did a lot of woodworking and building and um he was always making stuff and so he would he would doodle like little characters as all kind of like Pac-Man eye shaped characters, Betty Boop style and things, mm-hmm. with, you know, and he'd just draw those in like the TV guide or something. And I'd be grinning ear to ear, just kind of watching him like how it like magic, like, how do you do that? You just take a pen and draw that thing. And it's hilarious. So Did oh, yeah. a... We're looking. oh, we got a visitor. Oh. Um, so yeah, I would just kind of like, watch him draw and stuff like that and i just like comics and you know mom would always buy me something off the spinner rack star wars probably <laughs> grew the wanderer became a thing that i would read and my dad would actually read too so we could oh, share that. i love grew he's one of my all-time favorites Grew's amazing for sure have you met sergio aragonis i've been i've been like in his presence numerous times yeah but for some reason and i know he's the nicest guy ever he really i i, I get too intimidated to like actually speak to him because i probably just verbal diarrhea or something. i always tell the story that when i went to my first <laughs> convention i had that comic i made humbug which is like my first sort of indie comic um i went to his table which is him and stan sakai were side by side nice. and uh, i gave him a copy of my comic and he was like come back and see me tomorrow and i came back tomorrow and he had read it overnight with a bunch of notes and like i was super impressed with one of the nicest things wow. that he did not have to do that he did and uh, it just meant so much to me that he would go out of his way to do that. So that always, is outstanding. He, yeah. he's a legend, you know, in every way. Oh, and his and Gru is one of the greatest comics of all time. One of the funniest, funniest mm-hmm. sit sit downs you ever had. So, what did your dad do? Was he was he woodworker by trade or is that military a hobby? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he was military, but uh, when he would come home, he would, you know, he would fix cars. He would, our cars were always like he'd get them out of a. Uh, wreck you know and mm-hmm. fix it up um he built our house you know he would and when he retired he made toys for kids oh, you wow. know like it's it just it was always kind of a creative thing working in the shop so yeah if he, if we needed furniture he made furniture made mom tables or end tables or whatever she wanted kind of thing you know and wow. and 
really good you know like he would always be you know it would be sanded to like glass it would be airbrushed finished you know with uh with spray varnish and stuff that sounds amazing so, what yeah, was just, military was in uh air force uh oh, wow. what was he doing um search and rescue for a lot of years uh summer in cfp summerside here he was worked on the argus and uh and the tracker and he spent a little time in sherwood before uh, sherwood there work on destroyers before retired wow i uh and that's funny because you never like military and creative type don't normally go together in the same sentence so it's very interesting that uh yeah he was so creative outside of his military work yeah he was and uh big western fan big love oh. westerns you know reading reading a little more or watching the movies over and over and again and Fantastic. um it was really funny because uh as he was getting older he, he developed alzheimer's um but before he got too far gone uh, I remember taking him to see a couple movies in the theater. We went to see the the remake of um, what Grit. is that Western one? No, Grit. it was nope. that was the uh, oh Three Kenny Yuma. Yuma? Yeah, yeah, that's a great movie. And that was really really great. And then the other one I took him to was uh, Indiana Jones Four. Oh, and Crystal Skull. <laughs> He didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I think partly because maybe a little bit of the Alzheimer's, but also but what the hell's going on? I, I um, think it's a hard story to follow with all of your mental faculties in tech. I think so in a lot of ways, but what got me and, and I enjoyed was um, some of the special effects where they're driving along the cliff, mm. you know, and they're being chased by monkeys and they're on the edge of a cliff and they're just racing, racing. My dad's old enough at that point where he just doesn't get special effects. Mm. He's fully engaged thinking edge of his seat, like, Oh my God, they're going to fall off the cliff and die. Like I would never <laughs> drive on the cliff like that. Can you imagine? So movie magic uh, really struck home there. <laughs> oh, that's well, that's, that's awesome. It's, it'd be, it's really cool. Especially when you watch movies with kids to like, to see that when you can suspend your, like, it's, like uh, someone watched so much movies as I assume you and I do. I know I watch a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you're always looking for the wires, even when you're not trying to, you know, oh, yeah. when you're just trying to enjoy the movie or something, you're always looking at, at this and like i watched um beetlejuice uh mm -hmm. the other day, they're they're showing it at the theater again and uh you know the the end scene where she does well in her test and they they levitate her while while playing uh deo or whatever song it was at the end uh you know i'm looking i'm seeing the wires and i'm like i don't want to focus on this i just want to enjoy the last you know minute of the movie right yeah. but uh it's funny it's really cool that you can kind of relive that through your dad for sure yeah that was fun you know and, and it is I like movie magic like that. I, I can't help but look for the wires too. I just know too much about movies, watch too many to, to not see it, but it doesn't take away anything. No. But to see somebody who's solely engaged like that was was, was a moment for sure. That's awesome. Wow. So but anyway, yeah. So I would always draw, I guess, is what mm -hmm. your question was. And uh and I would draw in, like what I had in front of me is comic wise. I remember drawing pages, like trying to recreate pages from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the movie adaptation that Marvel put out big Indiana Jones fan um and you know Superman Batman Spider-Man sort of stuff too right but I never really I just was always the guy who would draw mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I had to you know decide what to do with the rest of my life in grade 11 12 sort of thing somebody said you need to like plan for what are you gonna do I don't know I, what I don't do I want to do like, then I don't like doing math and all this other stuff and I do like to draw, so I guess I'll go to an art school kind of thing. So, <laughs> uh, such conviction. I yeah, guess, I, I, I guess. Uh. I thought oh, I'll go. I'll go be an animator. I liked Looney Tunes. Uh, just I love Looney Tunes. I grew up on those, mm -hmm. and they're still the best cartoons ever. I agree. Even by today's standards, like the animation, all of it. Oh, like you watch it, and it's, it's they can't touch it. I they can't. can't. I, how could we not? Between then and now, how could someone else not do something as good? In I like don't know. 50 years. It's crazy. You can't make Bugs Bunny or any of them look the way that they, they no. moved and, and looked back then. It's just for some reason. And with the old school animation style, it's seamless. Seamless. Can't it's, do it. it's, it's amazing. So yeah. I actually so, just was talking about uh, the... So Chuck Jones did a adaption of the Jungle Book. Do you remember this? It's called like Mowgli's Brothers. No, I didn't. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> it, they put. I, I managed to snag a DVD of it years ago because I had it taped off TV. It was probably on something Magical World of Disney or something, 
and actually probably not because it was chuck jones but it was recorded off of something and it's like half an hour and it's just his version of the jungle book uh in in his animation style and Does this be late chuck jones like post uh, Brothers? i'll have to look it up i'm not 100 percent sure okay but um Phantom Tollbooth there, I'm guessing. It was like with the the voice. Well, the jackals even kind of look a little bit like Wiley e. Coyote in the, the animation yeah. style and stuff like that. But uh, in that version, Shere Khan was a white tiger, mm-hmm. and uh, I always just thought he was like this. There's scenes in done in his his animation style where he's watching through the grass and he looks terrifying. Like it was just it was he's the scariest version of the character ever, in my opinion, that I've ever seen. And I, I always it always stands out to one of the core movie villains to me that most people don't have never seen. Nin- Nineteen seventy six is when it came out. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it looks like it's on YouTube. So if anybody wants to watch it, yeah. Andre recommends. That's right, Andre. <laughs> this obscure twenty five minute short animation classic from nineteen seventy six. Um. Oh yeah. So what? What was? Uh, what was mom? Is she? She have a job as well? Like was she in the in the artistic field or? No, mom was, mom was taking care of me, you know, I was, I have an older brother and sister and uh, they pretty much grown up, moved out by the time I showed up. So. Oh, were you further away for behind in age? Yeah. Yeah. We got, we got a chunk of time between us with 10 or 15 years somewhat. Oh. So. Did they ever, did they have any artistic inclinations? My brother's a lot like my dad, you know, in that he like very hands-on, he can build anything, built an airplane. <laughs> you know, recently and crash it recently. <laughs> he survived, so he's going to rebuild it. I think he was more mad that he broke his airplane than he was that he crashed. You know? Oh, hopefully it so, wasn't a serious crash. I take it if he walked away from. He got a concussion, probably, but he's too stubborn to go to the hospital. And, ah, there's that old manly macho man that's mentality. Just, just like my dad. I'll just keep going until I'm dead. That's. that's yeah. I think my dad would fall into that same category for sure. My sister does like uh, she would she used to do these really cool mosaics using like floor tile scraps. It was a really cool idea. She had so you had all these really interesting stonework out of linoleum, you know. Yeah. And she'd get all the scraps and just cut them with blades and stuff and grout them together and make these really cool mosaics out of it. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So, so art school. Where what art school did you attend? I went to Sheridan College because I thought, well, I'll go take the uh, the illustration course, which is a three year course, and then that'll kind of prep me for going into animation. Um, but at the end of the three year course, I was kind of done with it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go back and and do that again. What about but animation? Ended, did you not warm up to? I just didn't want to go back for another four years, kind of. Thing. Oh, to finish the program, I see. I thought yeah. you were tapped out of animation. Well, there was a bit of, I uh, finished three years of schooling and my girlfriend at the time was back in PEI. So there was a motivation to move home. We broke up a couple of weeks after I back, moved back. Oh, that must have felt wonderful. And then I was stuck there. <laughs> ah, crap. Back here in PEI, it could have been in the, could have been in Ontario. It's nice of her to wait for you to uproot your life and come back to, to break up. With you. Yeah. Well, it's all water in the bridge now. So. That's true. I, su- I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay so well, beyond that was it uh like was comics sort of the option two after that is it just- well what actually happened is i actually moved back a couple of years later about two and a half years later i did move to ontario again i lived in ottawa for eight years and i spent most of those years actually working in animation mm-hmm. um <clears throat> i moved there and uh somebody had mentioned that Oh, they got some animation studios in town. They're like, well, I'm completely unqualified for that, but it beats working at a gas station. Mm-hmm. So I put together a portfolio and one of the three studios decided that uh, they needed somebody to do background illustrations. Can you draw backgrounds? I'm like, I can draw backgrounds. So I got work on Rupert the Bear. You know? Oh, really? <laughs> wow. That was my humble beginnings, I guess, working in animation in Ottawa for a lot of years. And then, as time went on, I, I started kind of like learning all the stuff they never taught me in school. I just self-taught myself how to do all the different things, like posing out things, learning storyboards, trying to make little short short films with Premiere and, and figuring out how to animate and timing things and stuff. So did that until the whole kind of auto industry went boom and moved back to PEI. <laughs> So I started doing started doing comics uh, while I was doing animation. 
Mm-hmm. That was one of the things just, I kind of discovered uh, some indie comics like Strangers in Paradise and Cerebus and Bone. And that kind of blew my mind because I was a little, a little bit like, well, animation's fun and all to a degree, to the degree that, you know, Canadian animation is generally crappy Nirvana stuff. And I was really sick of Rupert the Bear and Pippi Longstocking and <laughs> and North American Nelvana cartoon stuff, right? So yeah. I like wanted to be able to write and draw my own stories. And that's not something you can easily do in animation, but you can do in comics. And when I saw these other guys do it, I'm like, oh crap, you can you can do that. You can self-publish. Look at these great black and white comics I really enjoy, you know, and I'm here in the 90s. Like the black and white boom is over when I start <laughs> on my black and white indie comic. Uh, there's no distribution. I was 10 years late, but I, it, I got started. So so looking at those ones, like those indie comics, like I know you you have a, or you have, I don't, I don't know if I call it a friendship, but I know you have an, a, an association with, uh, with Dave Sim. So did you reach out to him like at that time to like, like, me, is that how you guys connected or is it to- in, in a weird way like Cerebus was a big influence on me because I hadn't read a book like that mm-hmm. I, I always read these episodic things with a rotating cast of writers and artists and stuff and Cerebus was just something completely different and the guy is a master visual storyteller as far as like his page layouts go and his storytelling is so cinematic and his timing is really good. His lettering is phenomenal. The background artist Gerhard is outstanding, you know, to kind of like mesh that all together. So <clears throat> that was a huge influence on me. And the fact that the guy was making a living doing this on his own. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had, uh, what did I do? I started making my own little comic called Kiroskiro. And it was very heavily sim influenced where I was like, what does Dave use? He uses S172 illustration board. That's what I'm going to get. He uses a Hunt 102 Crow Quill pen. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to cross hatch and all that, you know, just like Dave him. <laughs> and uh, so I wore my proverbial influence on my sleeve for the start of that book. And I'd sent him some issues. And he kindly wrote back and be like, you know, you're, you're supposed to start off with a story, not an epic. <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh and some very practical advice like that mm-hmm. um anyway he's like you know keep at it kid you know and whatever i was gonna keep at it anyways it's more or less just wanted to say like you inspired me and thank you mm-hmm. right and so i'd send him some stuff and when i finished uh i finished the book more or less uh i'd send him a copy like a print on demand copy I'd made. Mm-hmm. I'd sent a bunch out to different publishers and, and got no response whatsoever. And one of them I sent to Dave. And at the time Dave had a blog and he happened to review Kiroskiro. And he thought it, he liked it, you know, and made some various comments in his abstract Dave Sim way about it. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that that kind of random blog post did for me was that Ted Adams, the publisher at IDW, was a big Cerebus fan and was reading that blog and asked me, reached out like with an email and asked me, could I get a copy of your book? Dave was talking about it. Sounds interesting. I'd already sent IDW a copy of it and <laughs> they, didn't make it. they never made it to that high of the, the echelon. So I said, absolutely. It's in the mail now. <laughs> and uh, he got it, read it and offered He's like, we'd love to publish this as a hardcover graphic novel. And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, Man, it's a hell of a story. Yeah, it was just a blog post and it happened to be the right person at the right time who had the wherewithal to send out an email saying, I'd like to see more, you know, and basically set my comics career on track. That's fantastic. So I owe Dave for that. And I, I said, I would love for him to write the forward to the book for IDW, you mm-hmm. know. And he flat refused, would not do it. You know, no. I'm, the pariah, I'm the pariah king of comics. I will taint anything my name is associated with. Don't drag yourself down right out of the gates. Uh, That's <laughs> hilarious. Because I, uh, like when I, I, he he was doing like Dave Sims last signing tour ever or something. I think. Yeah, I, I was there. It. Yeah, I, I don't think I knew you then. I, I must not have because. You were there? I, uh, well, I was at the, because he did a, a portfolio review at the, the Halifax Library. 
Okay, I was there for that. I went to that, and then uh, and then I got invited to because I gave him a copy of my comic, and I and I sat with with. There's only like five or six people there. It was not many, considering how cool of an opportunity it was. Yeah. Um, and so I gave him a copy of my comic, and I got to talking to him. He seemed like a really cool guy. And they did like a glamour puss party, which is like a, everyone dressed up and like. Well, you know, we were there. Yeah, I I was yeah. there too. Me and my wife <laughs> okay. were there. We weren't married at the time, but me and my girlfriend. Um, yeah, we were there. So I must not have known you at the time because I remember I spent most of the night talking to Darwin Cook. But um, that's that's rough, man. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> uh like he was he was one of the coolest people and just so fun to talk to and always very friendly and welcoming and uh i'm sorry he's gone but man he was such a cool guy but we, at the party we were just like you know hanging out and do this whole thing and and then eventually he sent me a letter when he had time to review the comic just giving me some some tips and stuff and he had like he, he sent a line that i thought was really nice and i, and I messaged him I, and like he only writes letters like it's not email yeah or like, faxes it's, if yeah says it's 1990 something <laughs> Dave Sims still living there. Uh, but he, yeah, he would. Um, so he sent me a letter and I asked if I could use one of the lines and like maybe just to promote the book. And he was like, uh, no, <laughs> like just very flat out. No, he didn't even really like explain it. He was just like, no, I do not approve of that. And then that was it. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to push the matter any further. But it's interesting that that might be a reason I didn't I didn't realize at the time that maybe but when I was at that last signing that he did at Strange Adventures, I brought a copy of Kiroskiro and it was all printed by IDW. I said, I want you to do something for me. And this is 3.30 in the morning because he'd been signing for hours and he wouldn't stop. Right. So he's completely loopy with exhaustion. All the bar girls are coming staggering into Strange Adventures like, that's his place, comic books. They make comic books. And he signs comic <laughs> books for them, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I brought Kira Skiro copy up to him. And I was like, you know, nice to meet you finally. And here's the book, you know, that, you know, printed by IDW and stuff. And so I want you to do me a favor. I want you to write something on the cover. I, want you, to write, I want you to write the words, the forward <laughs> by Dave Sim. And that's all, right? Just write the forward. And anyway, you didn't know what I was talking about. You wrote the forward Dave Sim as opposed to the backwards Dave Sim. Like, Whatever, okay. Well, it's nice that you could have that dream realized, uh, if not later in life, at least. In could. one way or another, yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, so that started your IDW journey. Yeah, IDW is Kiroskiro. Uh I did I did a book of that, and um, so were you were kids in the picture at this point? Like, would you have family? No, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. No, we just moved back to PEI. I think I'd finished up Kiroskiro. I had started working on. I pulled out this old idea that I had with my friend Nick Cross as an animated series when I worked in Ottawa. When I lived in Ottawa. Uh, working in animation, me and my buddy Nick Cross, we went to college together, uh, developed an idea pitch for a series called Angora Napkin. And we wrote a whole bunch of scripts and storyboards and all kinds of stuff for it. But it never, never went any further than that, really. So after doing like five years of cross hatching on Kiroskiro, I was kind of like needing a break. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll just do something fun, loose, cartoony and, and goofy and just kind of like scratch that itch and, and then I'll come back and I'll do Kiroskiro volume two and pick up the story. And uh, yeah, that ended up taking another five years. <laughs> so as it was happening, then, you know, kids uh, came into the picture and, uh, and Gordon Atkins started getting some weird traction because um, IDW said that they saw it and they're like, yeah, well, we published that. And I'm like, great. Wow. That's cool. And it got an Eisner nomination, which blew my mind because it's a totally self-indulgent, just stupid story. You know, mm -hmm. like, why would that be Eisner worthy? So, but regardless, they published it in a hardcover, beautiful book. And I'm like, great. So it got an Eisner. Um, that's cool. And I think it was around then that Teletoon was looking for their like cross Canada pilot project. Mm -hmm. And so I had this book and I had all this pitch material and we put it together and it got accepted for the pilot project. So I'm like, holy crap, we're going to finally make uh, an Angor napkin episode. So it seemed like we were getting some traction with Angor napkin, had a, a book, a cartoon happening. And so I started another Angor napkin book. And so by this time, like Kiroskiro is a long forgotten project that people every so often ask me about, when are you going to finish that story? And I'm like, I don't know, like 
kind of like Twin Peaks, you know, maybe in 25 years. <laughs> but don't hold your breath. You That's know? right. So well, you can yeah, do so, a pre- you can do a prequel movie to keep everybody uh, pissed off longer if you want shortly <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> That's another uh, fandom you and I share is Twin Peaks. When I was uh, when I watched it, it was on like the Screen Channel after high school. Right. Uh, and then when it got to the, the the big cliffhanger season two, I was like, oh, I can't wait for tomorrow's episode because the show had already come and gone at this mm-hmm. point. It's like 2002, maybe when I was rewatching it. So I like, you know, I went home and then the next day it started over again. I'm like, what the hell? And I went to the library at school and looked it up on the Internet. And I'm like, that's it. I'm like, oh, there's a movie. OK, good. That must wrap it up. And I'm like a prequel. <laughs> <laughs> Very good prequel. Lynch. Yeah. <laughs> At least, at least the prequel is really good. Fire yeah, Walking actually, awesome. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, sadly, what? I know. it's because You haven't I'm, watched? Seriously? No, because I never had a copy of it. And I wanted to get a nice one, and I finally got the Criterion copy of it a while ago. And then I, uh, during when quarantine started, I was like, I'm just going to rewatch all the Twin Peaks. Like, from watch the new series, the movie, and the, or the old series, the movie, and the new series. Uh-huh. Then when, when life kind of started picking back up again, I never got to finish it. So I'm still going. It's just taking me a lot longer than I expected. I'm almost done the original series. Okay. I'm right around the chess matches with Linda Merle right now. So, oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Annie, 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 Annie just showed up. So I'm getting, I'm getting uh, through it. I'm getting through it. But have you seen? You watched the new series, though, right? Actually, no. Same reason. Oh uh, same god. reason. Same reason. We'll have. We can do a whole Twin Peaks episode. I'm sure. I right? think we should because I man, happily would do that. The, let me tell you, it if you like David Lynch, like it is full on the best that that new twin peaks series was worth the wait in every way well i've like i'm i'm getting through his catalog a little bit here and there and i uh i watch like blue velvet i watched many years ago and then uh, i really want to rewatch it again because it's such an interesting and cool movie uh maholland drive i've only ever seen half of it when i was like a kid so I'm, that's next on the list i'm really excited to get through that um i have lost highway I haven't watched that's that one movie. of my favorites I love i've heard that, that i've heard it's it's really good i haven't seen inland empire and I don't don't with that skip that one really okay yeah, you can you skip that in dune if you want and you're okay oh yeah i haven't seen dune yet either but i'm super excited for the new one so i was contemplating uh watching the old one prior to it coming out but i don't know if I, it I, looks I, good yeah it does it sure does so anyway i'm sorry you were doing the pilot project for Oh yeah, no. So just I I, I kind of got derailed from the whole Kiroskiro project because in Gore Napkin seemed like it was getting traction. I got two books and two Eisner noms and a pilot, and you know, it, that's it was taking years. I was like twelve or fifteen years of my life right there, kind of thing, just making these indie books that made no money whatsoever, like <laughs> at all, nothing, not a not a hardly a cent, you know. But in so, Eisner. Well, it got the right nod, but you know, yeah. nobody read it. it. Well, it's also hard <laughs> to translate that to to money sometimes. You know, yeah, uh, you can talk to any artist in any in any medium, and uh, all of them will tell you about you know all the the recognition they get, but it doesn't mm-hmm. always <laughs> translate to money. You know, so I ended up working in animation again, like storyboarding from PEI here for mm-hmm. some Toronto companies, just to you know pay the bills. And uh, I think I think the, well, I don't think I know the show that absolutely broke my back like for animation was Paw Patrol. <laughs> you worked on Paw Patrol? Yeah, I did. Wow. And man, storyboarding every on kid in the season world loves one. You. Yeah, well. I did the origin story of Rubble, so there's that, I guess, for my oh, wow. So. My cousin's but, daughter would be so happy to hear this. Oh my God. I was I've never been so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> never been so happy and unhappy in my life as working on do you trip. feel like in those mediums though like i this is just a question for my edification but like mm-hmm. in those in those mediums when it's like those deep kid shows like it's just for small children there's no you know artistic deep artistic merit there in, in any fulfilling way i'd imagine as an artist but are there people within that genre like did you work with people at paw patrol they're just super excited about it or all in or is it just a I, bunch of jaded people doing what they got to do to get to get through i'm assuming it's the latter because yeah. i worked from pei i wasn't in the studio oh that's true um some of the guys i've worked with like i did some stuff with that studio like just in time which is pretty good and uh the last thing i ever did in animation was um true in the rainbow kingdom which was kind of trippy and it mm. was pretty fun but i like the director a lot and he's a good guy uh with paw patrol it just felt like a product mm. and i mean it's a toy commercial it's a half an hour toy commercial the worst thing about it though is is the deadlines for a storyboard if you have to do a complete you know 
whatever 11 minute 20 minute episode in a month like rough pass and clean up but you got five dogs or six dogs a couple of humans they all have vehicles and all those vehicles transform it's like there's so much drawing involved just to set up a scene and clean it up that you're exhausted you know my hand was just like killing me and i just spent hours and hours and hours at the table drawing this stuff and <laughs> at the end of the day i'm like oh i drew six dogs running around you know i'm no i'm not even hardly into the story uh it was just I, trying to like connect the dots get through it and survive another day for a paycheck yeah uh, well you, you came out the other side yeah so i called idw up or emailed them i guess when i had had enough i basically quit paw patrol with like with nothing to like fall back on mm-hmm. And I emailed IDW because they're my only in on comics because I did those three books with them on my own and said, do you have anything I can do? Because as far as I know, they're like G.I. Joe and Transformers and stuff that I'm not very strong at drawing that kind of comic style. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I lucked out and they had just got the uh, Cartoon Network license. They hadn't announced it yet, but they were looking to like kick it off with Powerpuff Girls would I be interested? And I was right up my alley. I mean, I was a huge fan of the Powerpuff Girls. And so I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to draw it. I want to write it. I want to color it. I want to letter it. I want to do everything. And they're like, you've never worked in monthly comics before. So like back down there, you have no <laughs> idea what you're asking. You're like, you think you can do these things, Nemo? <laughs> but, Just keep swimming, baby. Yeah. But they let me write it. They let me draw it. And I managed to, letter as much as i could and i colored the first issue and then i realized that yeah there's no way i'm going to do six issues of this and maintain a monthly deadline so Mm -hmm. um that didn't that didn't happen (laughs) (laughs) well you you dreamt big and you got you got up there anyway just from that so did the the pilot thing ever took off i assume being that there's not an angora napkin cartoon out there right now yeah no the uh the one that got picked up was a show called and i say aptly called forget about it (laughs) how long did it last I don't know. <laughs> I never watched it. Uh, I don't even remember that. And yeah, I yeah, forget about it. To a lot of to some of that stuff from from the television and that stuff. I think it had two seasons. But yeah. Oh well. Forget about it. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. So now you're in Powerpuff Girls. Fantastic. Very cool. Yeah, I did. I did. I did the first big story arc, six issues of Powerpuff Girls, and then the next. Four issues. I had to. I have to give up two issues there because uh, my next child, Nathan, our, our third, was born, and I'm like, well, okay, I need a little break from comics there, and so they got a guy named Derek Charm on board, and he did a great job. Then I came in and did the last two issues, which I did get to color. <laughs> so I'm a control freak with comics. So as much as I could, again, write it, draw it, color it. I did as much lettering as I could. And that's why the, the independent press route is so good for you. I mean, you get, yeah, you know, definitely, definitely yeah. where my head's always been at is just, I want to DIY it. So it's very satisfying knowing that every part of it is done to, you know, I, there's so much involved with letting your project go, like, especially with comics. I mean, collab to be collaborative with another person to like, especially like the big, big ones where you just, have the writer then the penciler then the inker then the color there's so many people's got to go through mm-hmm. i imagine the end of the day the writers either have to have a certain sort of uh disconnect mentally to to get that part out of them because i would drive me nuts if i you know worked so hard and diligently on the way i wanted this to be and then like the guy had process six out of the 20 process did something i didn't like and then right. it's, it's different right like it's not quite exactly what you wanted so yeah 100 percent. that'd be i i couldn't handle that very easily you know you really have to kind of like learn to be a professional and, and distance yourself from it and be like okay yeah yeah um yeah it suits my temperament to just kind of well the thing i always loved about comics in a weird way is you're getting like the best of a movie and the best of a novel in one but you, you can get that unique vision of an individual who did it all you know it's like a Trent yeah. Reznor of it yeah, I, and came in and had a story to write and illustrate their own unique way and letter and and everything is just like hundred percent that person. Yeah, and I was really kind of was drawn to that. 
it's funny how the the creators that I seem to gravitate towards recent, like in the newer later years, are a lot of that. Like Jeff Lemire is one that I I love <laughs> his stuff, especially the projects that he you know draws and writes and does most of this the work on, like Sweet Tooth and those sort of things. Because so, it's a singular vision that you're right. You're getting all of it. It's everything they want in the way they want it to be done. Done, hundred percent. Yeah. Original, so. Yeah, hundred percent. Just I like that kind of unique perspective in, in that medium is just like no no other medium you know it brings the best of it all so powerpuff girls can you do that for quite a while yeah you know sending in my my pages there in the last series and uh i think they were gonna wrap it up and just as, as a little ps on one of my emails they were like you know this, this stuff it's all looking good great um P.S. Would you be interested in pitching for Fear and Loving in Las Vegas? <laughs> Adaptation is like, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> hell of a, that's a hell of a postscript. And, uh, you know, to the guy who's drawing Powerpuff Girls, like, seems like a <laughs> bit of a jump there. Uh, but, yeah, it's one of my favorite novels of all time. And uh, I definitely wanted to do it. And, uh, didn't, I, I ended up just not doing it for a long, long time because I'm like psyching myself out. Like, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to make it work. Like I'm going to bring it down. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to really do that. But I also kept thinking if somebody else gets this project, maybe they just treat it like a job. And I was, I'm going to treat it like it's a holy book in a weird way. Like something I really want to like, you know, give it my all. Mm. So at least if it, if it comes out crappy, at least I cared. Mm. yeah <laughs> we'll back it up with that i can totally understand that you'll know you'll so, give it at least the attention that that it, like the part of the recipe the attention to detail and, and the the love of the source material that you know a lot of people don't have when it comes to these adaptations yeah, i've read so many adaptions of books in comic form that are just heartless you yeah know, soulless yeah. i guess would be a better word but just don't yeah. feel like they capture anything close to what the way the book makes you feel there's no way i wanted to do that and i didn't want somebody else to step in and do it either so they eventually gave me an ultimatum <clears throat> and a deadline and said, you know, if you can't have something to us by, you know, Monday, then, okay, we're done, you know? Mm -hmm. So they kind of put me in, forced me to like, you know, or get off the pot kind of thing, mm -hmm. just to keep this PG. Oh, you can curse in soon. Okay. <laughs> If you want to, if I want to, I'll yeah. I mean, I don't want to pressure you into. You're not going to start throwing them all out, but uh, it seems like in the podcast world, it's just assumed at this point that you do. So I suppose so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I did a, I think one or two page. I mean, I think it's just a one one page. I picked a page from the book and I just kind of like interpreted. This is how I would do it. I wrote up a little synopsis of this is kind of what I was thinking. How I would approach adapting it sent it off and then just like spent the night swearing at myself that I blew it, I blew it, I blew it and feeling bad and awful. And then I got the job like two days later. <laughs> so you're off Powerpuff Girls. Your next year and a half is going to be adapting Hunter S. Thompson's famous novel to That's a graphic amazing. novel. Which so is again, I, 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 and I jumped on it the same way as I did everything. Can I write it? Can I draw it? Can I letter it? Can I color it? And this time they said, yes, I did actually do all of it, every aspect of it. Um, so it's that it's was, fantastic, by the way. It's really, really one you. of my favorite books. It's, it's As far as those adaptions go, it is a very, very cool version. Now, it, when, when approaching that, something with such a rabid fan base, I suppose, as well, I, I guess not rabid in like their Twilight fans, but you know what I mean? The people that like mm -hmm. it really like it. Oh, yeah. um, and know it know. inside and out yes of course as, as one of them first time i ever got death threats was... really <laughs> well, you, gotta you gotta tell me about that was that after well, it came out or like i had thing? basically the sample page and stuff like that i had done got put up on the news sites and stuff so mm -hmm. it was going around just hunter thompson's novels being adapted into a graphic novel and uh you know my name attached to it and my few meager credits and stuff and i think it was like a Facebook and other places or any, any comment thread Hunter Thompson's fan base is, is pretty rabid and yeah, they don't think unless you're Ralph Steadman that you should touch his work or his words in any way you just sully them. Um, 
So I got, you know, somebody break his hands before he gets to the paper or put fire ants in his eyes and <laughs> shouldn't it, this abomination and I'm not wow. going to read this. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and then I didn't even draw anything other than a sample page. So, <laughs> that's that's a nice way to get to jump into a project is to have a death threat immediately out the gate. Yeah. So when I it finally had f- finished the book though and, and it got out there, the, the gratifying thing uh, was winning over journalists because every journalist is a journalist because they got influenced by Hunter Thompson. Mm. So any and every book review of Fear and Loathing, the graphic novel, started with a huge disclaimer about how much Hunter Thompson means to me, mm. why I am a journalist. He's the reason for all of it. And when I heard this was going to be adapted into a graphic novel, I thought, no, this is the wrong. This is a bad idea and this shouldn't happen. Who does this guy think he is, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, after a paragraph disclaimer, they'll be like, but it's actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. So like, they have me sweating for most of it. Well, the worst part is, I mean, for you or in this situation is that you you are adapting this this beloved project and he is now no longer here. So at least when I imagine Gilliam and all those, like when he made the movie and and I'm not sure who directed with the Buffalo Realm, but the, the previous movie, um, like those guys must have went through hell too, but at least thompson was there to back it up i suppose you know at least thompson hates he, everything he, he, he would absolutely hate my book yeah hate it. But he, it. like he let johnny depp live with them and learn how to act like him and then go in the movies so there must be a level of him being okay with various adaptions because he did yeah. have nothing to do with the movie yeah i think i, I know anyway for a fact that thompson hates cartoons ah well like it's been it's doc, well documented when somebody said that they wanted to animate like a Ralph Steadman sequence of Hunter Thompson surfing the wave, like Mm -hmm. the culture wave and stuff. And and Thompson is like blows up and fires the directors and everything right there. This, Wow. (laughs) But you know, uh, it was really, it was super cool adaption and uh, yeah. And that's a, that's a crazy rabbit fan base. So the fact you survived it, it's the kudos. You also did a really cool, like, um, promotional tour didn't you like didn't you travel around and go to parts from the book oh hell yeah no i'd never been to vegas before so my uh you know what if i got the lose moment was i finished the book and be like message idw saying you know the there's only one proper way to promote this and that's fly me down to beverly hills and rent me a red convertible Sing horse slings mescal on the side and a high speed drive across the desert to Vegas, you know. They gave you and all you, that? You got the convertible too? Yeah. That's fantastic. Have you have you not seen the pictures of this? I've I've seen pictures of you in the coat and like in the, the glasses and the hat at different places, but I don't think I've seen you driving the court the, the Corvette. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, I got I landed in, in Dirk Wood, the marketing guy from IDW is at the airport and was like, let's go get that red convertible now. <laughs> So three in the morning, we're driving out of there in a red convertible through San Diego. That's amazing. And so like the, that was a really cool experience. And in so many ways, that kind of informs where I'm at now in some ways, because I set up to do a, uh, an, uh, a signing at IDW headquarters, like a private signing just for, you know, invitees and whatever, and, and the staff and things. And they had a big gallery showing all the artwork that I'd done. Um, so I'm there dressed like Hunter Thompson signing books and they're saying, do you mind if Kevin Eastman comes and signs with you? I'm like, I mind. Yeah, I've never met Kevin before, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, huge Ninja Turtles fan. That'd be amazing. Yeah. For and so sure. Kevin sat next to me and I drew like a Ninja Turtle in a Hunter Thompson hat with a cigar, like cigarette thing. <laughs> so I don't know, I guess I made an impression on him and he liked the book. Because, you know, flash forward a few years and it calls me up and I'm working with him now on some projects. So that all started just because, you know, in a winger prayer, I ended up doing a signing there in this book tour. That's amazing. So we went th- we went there and me and my publicist, Lee, uh, what was it Lee that time? No, it was, it was the other crew. I've been there twice now. I went, I went back for the Mint 400, another Hunter Thompson. Oh, yes, of moment. course, yeah. I thought I, remember, I thought you went for that. I was going to ask you that because I remember seeing photos yeah. of that as well. I feel like well, we an went... opportunity. I should have been like your lawyer or something. I could have. I could have. Oh, yeah, you would have been a great. Uh, I would have been Tom, fantastic. So. In yes. any excuse to go to Vegas and drive in a car. Yeah. <laughs> I could. We could, fly, <laughs> we could see if we could get a Tobey Maguire to stand on the highway and pick him up. Uh, <laughs> 
so we went up to uh we went to la after that and we did signing a meltdown mm-hmm. um and again another little touchstone to where i'm at now is they were doing the nerdist podcast that night when i was sitting in there and they're like huge lineup of people out and around the block and they're like do you want to come in and and see them you know harmontown <laughs> and i like i don't know who dan Harmon is i never heard of him i never watched any of his shows all right you know so i'm just like did you know of them like did you know about community or no No, i I heard the the words before but i've never seen (laughs) i've heard the word community yeah that's about it um anyway by the end of the night i was on stage playing shadow run on harmontown (laughs) (laughs) that was interesting like okay so there's a little precursor to you know working on rick and morty now so was there was to meet dan (laughs) Harmon? was that connected in any way like it was because you did that no i didn't think so no it was random synchronicity that's amazing yeah. So after that, those projects wrapped up, and you're doing stuff with with uh, with Eastman now, you're doing work as well. It's predominantly just within the Dungeons and Dragons, Rick and Morty comics, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Me and Jim Zub and Patrick Rothfuss on the first series. Leo Ito did all the coloring. Um, we've had a really good tight team, uh, mm. and that's been that's been really great. So I mean, moving from one cool project to another, like Powerpuff Girls, was pretty cool. Fear and Loathing was very cool. And then I get to work with Kevin Eastman, like, come on. Yeah. And and then working on uh, Rick and Morty and Dungeons and Dragons. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> Were you, okay, so I know you're a Rick and Morty fan. Were you when you got the project or did that come after? I hadn't watched it. Uh, I'd seen a clip. Somebody had shown me a few episodes, or sorry, a few minutes of like the wrong episode to show me. Mm. Like one that didn't inspire me at all to think this was like anything more than a poorly animated, poorly drawn ad lib, you know, stand up yeah. comics, you know, foray into cartoons. Yeah, yeah, cheap, yeah. cheap, 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 you know? Yeah. And it was like one of the inter- uh, oh, the interdimensional, inter- interdimensional cable. Yeah. cable. And I never yeah. liked those because they're just so ad libbed, right? Yeah, they are. There's some some moments in it that that are good, but yeah, I know what you mean. You can tell that he just gets drunk in a in a booth and just talks, and they animate around it. And it's all stuttering, and you know, I'm like, I don't know. If, you know, at, at least the second one sh- had the second one had a lot more of a, a story around it. Yeah, the one with you know, in, in the Werner Herzog cameo is always yeah uh, elevates anything to me. So. <laughs> And Jerry's penis and that whole thing was uh, was a nice was a nice touch. And the uh, the mind blowers episode was kind of a different take on that, but that one seemed more structured as well. From so I decided when when the offer came up on the table, like, would you be interested in working with this? I'm like, well, I better go see if I like it first. So I uh, I got a hold of season one, and I wasn't terribly like sold on it right away. Like the first episode was like, oh god, is he just gonna burp the whole time? And you know. It's pretty crude humor. Uh, mm-hmm. But then I think it was like, it was the love potion episode. Yep. That's what, that's what I'm And yep. then I was like, okay, I'm hooked now. Like, like that got me in a way. I was like, oh, geez. And then you get a few more episodes that were really, really smartly done. Yeah. And, and I was like, all right, this, this is like trying to find its legs, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think it found them. Yeah, that's so. that's the exact same episode for me too. Um, because I've been rewatching with a friend who never watched it before, and we're I think we're halfway through season two now. So whenever you come over to watch a movie, you always watch a couple episodes of that first. Nice. But uh the one like he was he was enjoying it, but that episode is fairly early on. I think it's the third or fourth episode. Yeah, it's the third episode. And it was like and it was smart for them to do it when they did it, because then they're like like the scary Terry episode and the dog one. And I can't remember what the second episode was, but they're all clever and had some fun stuff. And that was the first one that really gave you that emotional gut punch. That, that you know that existentialism like at the door sort of stuff that was just sort of there but never really in your face and like yeah. every once in a while and usually like when one of my favorite episodes come up i'll precursor the episode by saying this is one of my all-time favorites if i had to like make a top 10 this, and i guess there's only like what 40 episodes so maybe less um so top 10 is quite a bit but it's a top five uh to say like these ones are in it and that one was for sure one of the ones the the other one with unity is a is a big one i think that the um the hive mind girlfriend when they yeah. go to the, yeah and the first, uh, first episode of season two is like one i like showing people oh the time one the time yeah, where it's yeah. fractures and fractures yeah. and fractures it's very and clever so well done 
And another one that I often draw back to that if I had to show, like those ones would be ones I'd show people that try to hook them on the show. But the one with uh, Stephen Colbert with the, the battery, the universe oh, yeah, the battery yeah, yeah. powers the car. That Cause, one, yeah, yeah. that one is a super, super clever uh, episode to me. That's and good. I, I really, really like that one. And then, and as far as the new seasons go, there's some amazing stuff. The, the one that I talked about the most is on a pack, podcast a while ago talking about it. And, um, uh, we're talking about the toxic, the toxic Rick and Morty episode where they go to the cosmic spa and they remove all their <laughs> toxins, but then the to- they become basically different people because the the worst parts of themselves are still part of you. And I was right. like, I love, I just love the theme of that one so well that like, if you could isolate everything you think is bad about you and and, and get rid of it, <laughs> like you're not really you anymore. And uh, yeah, and there's a real human you know dynamic to that that i think they, they really nailed them in the head with that episode so I, I really feel like they hit some some real heavy points in some really interesting way they walk a really fine line with it which is what makes it really good it's yeah because rick rick is a terrible terrible person mm-hmm. and every so often he recognizes that and yeah he may not do anything about it but you know well there's i find there's a different especially in that show and maybe in real life as well i don't know if you can attest to this but i feel like there's there's people that he could ostensibly say are terrible people you know like they choose to be they know the better and they choose not to be better uh and then there are what i would call broken people that something in them is not something's happened or something in them or in their past or or just something about them in their personality that there's something missing because something broke in them a long time ago that was never quite put back together and i feel like that show really focuses in on that like i know Harmon talks a lot about the sort of themes and things he does, especially in community. Uh, but in Rick and Morty, it's very prevalent. And Rick and even even the other characters like Jerry and Beth and, and Morty and Summer to a lesser extent, but but those characters as well. And even Bird Person and some of the other people uh, that show up in a little bit. So like it's it's a real like testament to that that like broken type person that's still trying to carry on. And uh, I think that they do an amazing job with it. The Vindicators episode is one of the best ones <laughs> for that yeah, they, reason. They, they, they pack so much creativity that it makes like the crappy drawings kind of work now. Like yeah. actually, and especially with the background environments that they put them in is just mm. incredible. So you get these really awkward and cruddy drawings, but you made them work so well that it actually feels like the right look for them. I wouldn't want them to look any different. I agree. Yeah, it's 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 you can't see it any other way now. If it was animated yeah. in any other style, wouldn't wouldn't seem right. Because there's a lot of animation that just has that like adult cartoon look, like King of the Hill, and I hate it. I won't watch it. You know. Just, oh, you weren't a King of the Hill fan? No, I will not sit still for that. <laughs> I will not. I will leave a room. I will walk out of the house. Oh, I have a lot of time for my judge. Anything he does, like no, I don't. I can't. I can I can test you. And now they, they tried to get me to do a pitch for Beavis and Butthead comic one time, and I said I'll do an illustration for you, but I don't want to draw the comic. <laughs> <laughs> but did you? Did I? Were you just a Ren and Stimpy fan, or did you work on something with that as well? I worked on the uh, the adult cartoon party Ren and Stimpy. Right. So that was okay. the one that came out like for like six episodes on Spike TV that nobody liked. Right. You're right. I remember us discussing this, and I remember thinking about that as well. Because I, I was looking through some old comics the other day and I came across uh, one of Dan Slott, who's like one of Marvel's golden childs right now for for writers. He used to write that series. He wrote the uh, the Spider-Man Powdered Toast Man crossover episode, issue. Oh, uh, Yeah, so okay. like that's how he got his start was in, in uh, Ren and Snippy comics. He wrote Spider-Man for a very long time. He's doing Iron Man and Fantastic Four right now. But right on. It's fantastic. So is it was it Advan- uh, Rick and Morty Dungeon Dragons 2 that just wrapped? Or yeah. Three? Okay. Yeah, two. Is, is there a three coming, or can you not divulge? Uh, they're doing a collected volume right now. I'm doing a backup story for it. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so I don't know there's going to be a third one. We, we did kind of leave up a little opening for a third one, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Was it <laughs> so? As a, as a Rick and Morty fan, I see that aspect of it. But um, were you like the old dungeon? Because like characters from the Dungeon Dragons animated cartoon kind of made their way into it too, didn't they? Yeah, and I think I mean I would have suggested it if it hadn't already been put in there by by Zub and Patrick Rothfuss because mm-hmm. Patrick and like they're just way deep into the into the D and D and fantasy world, you know. Mm-hmm. Like Jim Zub is basically the goodwill spokesman for Dungeons and Dragons well, on this planet. Quite so, a while now. <laughs> he knows his stuff. Yeah. Um, so they were a really good good combo. Jim kind of brought the the D and D expertise um patrick brought a lot of the, the character in the heart and they just combined together to write a really good 
good and interesting story that wasn't just like a mashup cash grab, mm -hmm. you know, which is what I think most people might have thought it would be right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But if you read it, it's actually pretty damn good. Yeah, it's a really fun book. <clears throat> so I get to, you know, draw the funny pictures for that. <laughs> so um, in, of course, the Ingor Napkin Kickstarter was just uh, just just came through. I got my my photo view on my uh, on my <laughs> on my desk here. Thank you. you. It, right? I, it's Very funny because when I when I I, uh, I don't know if uh, pe people got the full story on on the podcast before. You better lay this out if you haven't, because <laughs> I better what lay out lay out what happened. Here oh yeah. So so uh, I kickstarted. Well, I spoke with Brenda before, and uh, and she'd mentioned the Turnip King, and then at the same time you had had the uh, Kickstarter going for Angor Napkin. So I glanced over the kickstarter to back it and i noticed you had the option to get both so i was like oh great because i didn't have turnip king yet so I'll, I'll get both in one sitting so when i when i kickstarted you have the uh the suggestions and my suggestion was please send a sexy picture of troy and uh, i was quite I, and, uh, and i kind of forgot about it but then when i finally got my package in the mail i i kind of opened the box and looked through it didn't see anything and i was like oh they must not have done it or missed or missed it and then i opened the, the page and it fell out <laughs> and i just and it's this Photoshop picture of Princess Slave Leia from Return of the Jedi with a very well Photoshop picture of a happy looking Troy. In, on you can thank life. Brenda for that. She had done that not even recently. That's an old school photo of me. Oh, really? That's hilarious. And man, yeah. I laughed. I laughed for about 20 minutes. And I even bought, <laughs> I bought a frame and put it on my desk. It's sitting by my uh, Spider Man sketch from Sandy Carruthers. You're, you're welcome, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it made me very happy good sure. i know uh my wife uh walked in my office picked something up and didn't even know i put it there and uh, sent a, a photo and a message to all of us saying that she just discovered it and was laughing about it so it's fantastic so you guys have a a, a book together through pega pega moose press which is your independent comics label yes uh, that you're putting out uh, i don't we don't have any details about that yet do we no, no, you're looking. You're looking for a scoop. I see. Well, I don't need a scoop. I'm just. Wondering. If there were details available, I will happily uh, talk about. I can, I can kind of give you the broad scoop on it, though. It's sure. um, so we, yeah, a few years ago, I guess a few years ago, last year, mm -hmm. um, Brenda and I had been working on our spare time projects. Me and, and Gore Napkin, the web comic, and Brenda, this project called the Turnip King. Mm -hmm. for about seven years kind of in the background so while brenda's doing my little pony and i'm doing fear and loathing we're just picking away at these other projects in the background <clears throat> it got to be so we were almost wrapping them both up at the same time and thinking you know well not so much thinking but noticing that a lot of people are having success with crowdfunding and making their comics happen and that's always kind of a little bit of our our headspace of that diy you know mm -hmm having that control over it. So why don't we, hey, we have two books almost ready to go. Why don't we start our own little imprint and see where we can go with this and uh, try out the whole Kickstarter thing. So Brenda was our guinea pig because she was done first. And uh, that went really well, fully fully funded and everything delivered in two months. And we had this beautiful hardcover book all of a sudden, you know, collecting all our hard work. So mine was next on the chopping block and that came up just past August. Um, same thing you know we got a successful kickstarter and now we have two books out like, okay so what's what's our roadmap was part of our thinking mm -hmm. um and we never ever really kind of thought about collaborating too much we're just too kind of independent <laughs> doing we have our own ideas and our own things and our own mm -hmm. way of drawing and storytelling so but it just kind of so happened that we had an idea that gelled together something like a, a like as a friend of mine calls it it's, it's our ep it's what fits in between our big books mm -hmm. so um we came up with an idea for a project and it's literally like a 50 50 book I, I, we wrote it together half and half i'm drawing half she's drawing half and our halves overlap so that she'll be drawing some on my pages i'll be drawing some on her pages so it's gonna be this interesting like really loose kind of creative um i don't know what you call it, like a little spooky story like in bd style we want to do like a big asterisk size book 60 pages um yeah a little spooky story we collaborate on that sounds awesome so we'd be traveling to conventions and every so often we you know just start hey what about this and uh, what about this and pitching ideas back and forth um until we kind of get a story together we thought would be cool so 
Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. When when will that? Do you guys have a timeline as when that'll be hitting the old Kickstarter? Or? Uh, well, it'll be next year. Um, hopefully things level out globally. <laughs> That'd be nice. It'd be That'd nice if you could do conventions. To, to push these yeah, people. that's just it. We've got uh, yeah. two books downstairs and, and boxes full of them, and we can't sell them because there's nowhere to take them. Yeah, um, just, it really sucks. Yeah, but you know, someday we'll get back to that. For sure. But yeah, we'll do another Kickstarter probably. I'd like maybe in the spring or something. So my half is, I got to jump on my half because I had some time and Brendan got really busy with the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so mine's drawn and I'm coloring it now. I say now I got to finish this Rick and Morty thing and then I'll get back to finishing it. So mm -hmm. I'll be done my half of the book, kind of waiting for Brendan to do her half of the book, um, which Fantastic. will probably start for her in January. Fantastic. So when you guys do these Kickstarters, you get the, the finished book done before you get to the Kickstarter page? Not like yeah. printed, but like yeah, all the artwork. Done, done. Like one thing we're really adamant about is I've seen a lot of people do Kickstarters wrong. Yeah, you wait four and years and then you may get it maybe if they finish it in time. Exactly. You know, yeah. like I want, I want to have the book done and ready to go to press. I want, so when we get our funding, basically you're, you're getting your books faster than you're probably getting them through previews, you know, mm -hmm. like a month and a half usually is what it takes and we have everything out the door to people that's fantastic so you know we went kind of build up that you know a quality book like nice hardcover good paper we we go kind of the extra mile just to make it give it a nice finish and mm. and make it if we're we're putting so much work into making the book we want to kind of present it with that kind of care as well so mm. when people are saying how come i can't get a digital edition it's because i don't want you to read it in digital edition I want you to hold it in your hand and feel the paper and, you know, <clears throat> yeah. Didn't, I didn't just spend all this time to like have you put it on your iPad and get around to reading it someday and never look at it again because it's yeah. not something you pull off your shelf, you know? Yeah. I, I, I don't want to be the, the Katerian old guy that says that stuff. Like, oh, the books are, books are better. You smell them and, you know, but I still buy Blu-rays and stuff like that. I like in records. I like the, the, the ritual of taking it out, looking at it, you know, putting it in, watching all the special features, same with the books, reading all the supplemental stuff in the back, the front, and just holding it and having the experience of sitting there and, you know, immersing yourself in it instead of just like reading it on the train or something or the bus or the plane. I you always know. think of it's like vinyl collectors, you know, yep, there's, there's same book way. people out there, there's vinyl people out there. They like, they like the tactile feel, the smell, the experience, the booklet, Pouring over it. Unfortunately, for my pocketbook, I am I am both. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so. You know, if I can get it out there, it's it exists. If it's digital, it's inferior. It's you know, it's just it's vapor. It doesn't really feel real. Exactly. My my crowning achievement was uh, seeing one of my independent comics on the rack at Costco. Right, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> with the sticker in the back, stuck in a bundle of comics in the back, and that was that was the the. Yeah, I, I get a it. kick out of I get a kick out of finding my books in like used bookstores. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Somebody was done with this and and sold it. Said, yep. And every, yeah. I always open them up and see if I uh, if I do a sketch in it. You know, oh, that's a smart idea. Stuff. Or like you know, like uh, you know, treasure it always, Troy Little. You know, like giving yeah, off. Yeah, I had a good set off to the bookstore. I had uh, a guy come up to me in Vancouver this year, and he had it in Gore Napkin book signed to Sal you know with this character and i was like are you sal and he's like nope <laughs> so i scratched out sal and i drew a new sketch on it and i was like to my new biggest friend you know atticus whatever his name was right uh, screw sal he wasn't my biggest fan yeah, screw that guy sal you should get rid of the sal meanwhile sal like died and his mom just sold his comics off or something you're like fuck you sal oh, i never thought of that <laughs> <laughs> I owe Sal an apology. Oops. That's actually mm, man, that well, uh, you know, not necessarily. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, it's possible. I assume if any of my books make it out there, that's probably what would have, would have happened. I certainly wouldn't have been wouldn't have been shooting out there for sure. So if you find any of any books with for to Andre from Troy Little, it's because I'm dead. If they're in a, in a <laughs> you, <laughs> you better be. <laughs> <laughs> you better be dead, mate. So uh, so that's chair. That's the project then now, right? You have anything else to go or? Uh, yeah, no, it's it's called Butterfly House, and it'll be coming out next year. Oh, so. I love the title, fantastic. Um, so we got that. Uh, I've got as soon as I got that done for me, um, I am adamantly going to be getting on 
to a project that is 10 years old. I've been, <laughs> if you flip to the back of my, uh, my last indoor napkin book there, the Harvest of Revenge book that came out in 2010. Oh, I do have that one, but it's in the other room. All right. Well, if you flip to the back, it says I'll be working on my next book called the illusion of life. Well, <laughs> that's 10 years ago and I haven't touched it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's your twin peaks. It's so that's going to be my next, that's going to be my big uh, Pegasus Express book that I'm going to be working awesome. on next. And right. I think we're, we're going to look at probably doing some, uh, doing it like a web comic because uh, you want to start getting some eyeballs on stuff before you run a Kickstarter again. And see that's if a it good works, idea. Yeah. Works pretty well. Well, there was a, <laughs> there was a moment there. Where I know you and I were talking before where it seemed like you were going to become the adaptation of famous books guy. Because Briefly. Yeah, briefly. You would never happen. I know you'd worked on potential a potential in nineteen eighty four, right? Nineteen eighty four. Uh and a potential the, Slaughterhouse Five as well, right? No, it wasn't Slaughterhououse. It was uh it was Breakfast Breakfast Champions. Champions. And I just read the Slaughterhouse Five that I, I read it too. What'd you think? So good. I very, very much liked it. It yeah. was it was another it, it made me feel like when I read Fear and Loathing, it was like it it like this guy got it. Like yeah. the art style worked really well for it, which yeah. kind of reminded me of you a little bit. And uh, it was almost <laughs> I was like, I feel like Troy might have written this. And, you know, like this could have been Troy's book. Um, I think Ryan did a really good job adapting it. And when I did, uh, what I was going to do with Breakfast of Champions was exactly kind of what I did with Fear and Loving in Las Vegas, which I've always had an issue with adaptations that they adapt things and, and they take liberties. And so they take that thing that you liked or you enjoyed and add their own little spice to it. And that usually ruins it. I agree. If it's I turning you. a book to a movie or something. It's like, this isn't what I on board for. I want to see my book. I want to yeah. see not, you know, your screenwriter adaptation of that story. I enjoyed. Yeah. It's like, you don't have to, you don't, you can make a really competent, amazing thing in your own little style without having to change it enough to say, this is, you know, to make it your own. Like it's really about mm. celebrating what it was. And I don't know, I feel like a lot of people get into that when they have to have to put their own little stamp on it. And usually that's where it falls apart. Usually, sometimes. Usually, because Ryan did a very good job of adapting something to a new medium mm -hmm. and, and definitely took some liberties with it, but kept it within the spirit of the whole thing yeah. that I didn't the soul feel. felt the same. If I could yeah, it. I didn't feel like it lost track there. And it was very pedantic with Fear and Lonely in Las Vegas because every word in the book is in the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. There's, there's not a letter I changed as far yeah. as that goes. Yeah. So it's Hunter Thompson. Like I figured the worst case scenario for the Hunter Thompson fans, if you don't like the artwork, at least it's Hunter Thompson's words. Like you, that's what you're on board for. <laughs> that, right? That's that's what you'll be saying when they knock down your door to kill you. The words yeah. are there. The words <laughs> are there. The words are there. If you don't like the pictures, well, I'm sorry. If you do, then cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, actually I just picked up the um, I think it was Arrow Video who they they're a specialty company that does uh, re-release of like Blu-ray Blu re-release of old movies and stuff and they just did the the film adaption of Slaughterhouse Five from like mm -hmm. the 80s question mark 70s 80s I don't know if I've seen it even yeah I've seen I know of it but I don't think I've actually sat down to watch I know Vonnegut actually gave it a seal of approval so I'm excited to to uh, give that a watch as well but I the graphic novel really uh really struck a lot of the same chords the book did for me and I'm, i've kind of jumped it, it's funny because i read slaughterhouse five a long time ago and then i recently read mr rosewater a good yeah. um, rosewater and then re reading the graphic novel after that i forgot that rosewater was in slaughterhouse five and i love the sort of cohesive marvel universe he has with this book so they okay he does yeah Kilgore trout shows up and that's true he does yeah, yeah. Little, and little uh, crossover cameos yeah it's really fun but uh, anything else you wish to uh, to promote, being at the on the, the meager show that I have here? Ah, promote? I don't know. I think we got it all covered there. We got it covered. <laughs> I, I've, I've got the essence of Troy locked in. I have your soul now locked into yeah. this podcast. Uh, yeah, no, I think. I mean, that's, that's pretty much got me up to date as far as that goes. Um, Butterfly good. House could be our next book. I'm picking his press is hopefully going to have some web comics happening next year. Brenda's got a book on the go as well. Again, she can get back to it. Yeah. She's good. She just has ideas upon ideas. I don't, I don't know how she does it, but I think just when you're sitting at the drawing table so long and your brain starts to wander when you're inking mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I think these are story ideas. I want to go draw. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the, uh, that's, that's the, the constant thing with, uh, with creative types, myself especially, and I got to break myself of it, is that um, 
you know, I saw something online and it was like the, the step, like being creative. It was like step one, come up with the idea. Step two, uh, tell everyone about it and start working on it. And then it was like step three, finish. But that, that was X'd out. And then it was like an arrow to step four, which is like start a new idea or start a new project. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it was like, I, I feel like that you're always a magpie. There's always, you get started when you're in the thick of it. Something else comes into your head and you want to get working on that. It's, you really oh, yeah. focus on that you, first project. You need a little uh, Yoda with a stick on your head. His, never his mind on where he was, what he was doing. <laughs> true. <Yeah. laughs> and then I'll tell him about all my ideas. He'll just get bored and died like he did in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, man. It was a real, real pleasure to talk to you. That's good to hang out. Hopefully we can actually do this uh, you know, over a beer or something someplace in person. Well, I'd like to, being that I can't do the vacations like I normally do every year, at least a vacation. I kind of did a mini one. I'd like to try to do like a maybe a winter one and head up to PEI again for a week or something. Yeah, for sure. So we'll definitely we'll definitely hook up, grab a beer and uh and talk about our our uh, our fan fiction for aliens. Good, yes. And uh <laughs> Body slams and pile drivers and all that kind of fun stuff. Sounds too, good. You know? well, yeah. Aliens meets wrestling. This is the book. Throw down. I, I feel like we've already started a great independent graphic novel right here. Great. Now I'm thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It'll be coming out in Peggy Books Press in two years. Uh, <laughs> thank you very good much. Talk, good talking to you, man. You too. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. And there it is, my conversation with Troy Little. Man, what a fun talk. What a fun guy. Make sure to pick up those books. They are amazing. His adaption of Fear and Loathing Las Vegas is superb. Uh, I haven't seen much of his work on Powerpuff Girls, so it's never really my thing. But uh, the uh, Ingor Napkin stuff is so just so wonderful. And, and uh, the Rick and Morty Dungeon Dragon stuff is fantastic as well. Uh, very big fan of all of that. Big, very big fan of Troy. He's a great guy and a good friend, and I'm uh, excited to to uh, to have that conversation with him. And also, we were discussing maybe getting together sometime and watching that adaptation of Slaughterhouse Five, which is a book we both love very dearly from a writer that I am is very quickly becoming one of my all time favorites, Mister uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, you know, as as it goes, or so it goes. Is that what they say in the in the book when people die? So it goes. I think it's so it goes. I'm gonna look it up right this very minute because I have a computer in front of me. So it goes is how is how it's said, which uh, which is a nice little thing that they say whenever someone dies, uh, because within that book they describe time as not being linear; it's only experienced linearly by humans like us, uh, other species like the Trafalgars who uh, Trafalgians who Trafalgarians that sounds right, uh, who experience time all at once. So you know, if someone's dead; they don't really see it as them being dead. It's just that, that particular point in time, they are not alive. But you know, every point of time is all lived at the same time. So you just move a little further along, or or back, and you're back to a point when you're alive. So it's a nice way of looking at it, and uh, I kind of hope it's true. I mean, you know, I don't really believe in afterlife, but I like the idea that I get to continue in some way. Or that I don't really end in some way, which is probably more accurate as to how they describe it. But happy Halloween, dear listener, and thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we'll be back to a regular format in which we'll be talking about one of my all-time favorite characters, Animal Man. Uh, Garrett Morrison's run on that comic uh, changed me fundamentally as a person, as a comic fan, as someone interested in literature and and, uh, and the, the boundaries that can be expanded by uh, subversive writing and Graham Morrison certainly is a lot of examples of that and Animal Man is one of the big ones in my opinion so I am very excited to talk about Animal Man and I hope you have a wonderful Halloween I hope you get lots of candy I hope you watch some scary movies scary movies I hope you watch some scary movies and I hope you have an overall great day thank you for tuning in and I will see you next week <laughs>